Hello and welcome to the Urban Classroom. Hi, I'm Mrs. Briggs and thank you for joining me today in the Urban Classroom. Today I'm going to be teaching Unit 4 of 8th grade U.S. History and this unit is called the Constitutional Convention. In this unit, I'm going to teach about the challenges and the achievements and the compromises that were made at the Constitutional Convention back in the year of 1787. So we're gonna talk about Congress, how Congress was organized. We're gonna talk about um, an event called Shades Rebellion. We're going to talk about the challenges of creating a uh, bicameral Congress. We're going to talk about the limits of the Article of Confederation. It's just a lot that we're going to talk about in this unit, which is the Constitutional Convention. So let's get started. So here's a very quick review. Um, remember back in Unit 3, when we were talking about the American Revolutionary War, we had Thomas Jefferson. He wrote the Declarations of Independence, and this document was a list of grievances against King George III of Great Britain. Well, this document told the king why the colonists didn't want to be a part of Great Britain anymore, that they wanted to separate. Now, after they, so to speak, fired the king and the governors and said, get out, you're not in charge of us anymore, they had to create their own form of government. And so the document called the Articles of Confederation is the document that created the framework for these now 13 independent states. Because remember, after uh, they declared their independence, they said they're not colonies anymore, that they were 13 independent states and nobody was in charge of nobody else. They were just like a, a league of, of friends. They, they were just 13 groups and they were all independent. And kind of think of it like each each independent state was like its own country in a way. So you have these groups of people who got together, they met, they set up a new government using a document called the Articles of Confederation, and they were trying to practice democracy. In a democracy, it's where you have people who vote and then the majority rules. So you, you listen to everybody's ideas and their opinions, and you don't always think alike, but you work out your differences and then you compromise to reach a solution. So this document called the Articles of Confederation, it sets up the new government in uh, for the Americans. And this is during the actual American Revolutionary War. Okay, now this document called the Articles of Confederation, for short, I like to call it the AOC. Articles of Confederation, the AOC. It had strengths, but it also had some weaknesses. So let's focus on the strengths first. Okay, so under this document, because you know you can't do anything without paperwork. If you don't have paperwork, you can't do it. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. So this document called the AOC, it allowed each of the state to have their own militia. Uh, militia, think of it like a small group of men who have weapons and they can protect and they can defend the independent state. So since there are 13 independent states, then you can have 13 uh, militia groups. Okay? So each state was allowed to have their own militia. Each state was also allowed to print their own money. See, nobody was in charge of nobody else. So one state could not make rules for another state. Each state made their own rules about how they were going to print their money, how they're going to coin their money. That was considered a strength under the AOC. Later on, it will prove to be a problem, but as the from, from the beginning, it was considered a strength. Another strength of the AOC was that Congress could declare war and Congress could negotiate treaties, according to the document called the AOC. Um, Congress also was able to set up postal systems, you know, how, how you have mail to get delivered. Well, Congress also has set up a postal system as well. Another strength of the AOC was that there was no executive leader. Now, executive leader is like a person who's in charge of everybody in the country. 
It could be like a king or a ruler or an emperor. That would be an executive leader. For today, it would be a president. Well, the Americans felt it's good that we don't have an executive leader because that person could have too much power and then abuse us like King George III did. So no, it's a good idea. We don't have one person who is the leader for America. Another thing that was considered a good idea under the AOC is not having a national judiciary. Now, when I said judiciary, think of like a judge. The Americans thought that it's good that we don't have like one group of judges who are in charge of all of America when it comes to court cases. They said it's better that each state have their own set of judges to hear the court cases. So this was also considered a strength of the AOC, just like not having an executive leader was considered a strength. But later on, they're going to see that and this will create some problems in the future. So we have some strengths of the AOC, but we also will have um, more, more benefits of the AOC. One thing that the AOC allowed was the ability to sell land. Under the AOC, another document was created called the Land Ordinance of 1785. Now, this document was needed because you got more land after the American Revolutionary War. Remember all that land where the king said you couldn't go over there? It was by the Appalachian Mountains. You couldn't pass the Appalachian Mountain because Native Americans over there. And if you go over there, it's going to cause a lot of problems. So the king said after the French and Indian War, you could not be in that area. Well, that area is now available for Americans to move west because once the American Revolutionary War was over with, and the Treaty of Paris from 1783 was signed, now Americans have a lot of more land. So they can go over past the Appalachian Mountains. They can continue to go west all the way up to the Mississippi River. But they can't pass the Mississippi River because that territory and that area does not belong to the Americans. Now, to get more people into the Northwest area, you'll see it on the map, look inside the circle. To get more people into that area, um, the government made some promises. The government could not tax people directly. So in a, a way to get money was to sell land to the Americans, to the citizens. Now in this area, slavery was not allowed. So if you're gonna come to this area, you could not practice slave labor. You can use free labor. Now, free labor don't mean you work for free. Don't get it twisted. Free labor means you work and you choose what kind of job you want and people have to pay you. That's called free labor. Let me say that again, because I don't want you to get that confused. Free labor means you get to pick whatever job you want. And when you work, people have to pay you. That's called free labor. That's different from what is called slave labor. Slave labor is you force people to work for you. You don't pay them. And that's what happened to enslaved Africans. So in this area, the Northwest Territory, there's a document called the Land Ordinance of 1785. If you want to come into this area, the government is saying we cannot have any slavery in this area. And the government is also saying, but we will provide free public education. So come on over to this area because your kids will be able to get an education, be able to go to school. In this area, they also practice religious freedom, religious tolerance. So it didn't matter what religion you were, nobody going to bother you. They're not going to start any problems with you because of whatever religion you practice. So you can have the, the freedom of religion in this area. And also in this area, let's say you went over there and you got in trouble. Well, then you can have a trial by jury. That means you go in and, and people in your community in your area, they listen to both sides of the story and then they would make a decision about you being guilty or not guilty. Okay, so these type of um, privileges and opportunities were provided for settlers who wanted to move into the Northwestern Territory. And again, it's on the map, it's inside that uh, red circle. That document was created 
when the government was operating by the AOC, the Article of Confederation. Now, another good thing about the Article of Confederation is that it, it allowed another document to be created. There's another document because you can't do anything without paperwork. This document is called the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Now, this document is important because it provides a very organized and methodical way for a territory to become a state. When I say territory, I'm just talking about a amount of land, a certain area of land. Well, there's paperwork that has to be done to become a state. There are some rules that has to be followed. There's some criteria, guidelines. So if you have 60,000 people, if you can get 60,000 people into the area, then that area, which is called a territory, could become a state. And the document called the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, it provided a way for people to settle in the territory, in the Northwestern Territory, that's past the Appalachian Mountains. And once you became a state, your state was given the same rights and the same privileges and the same opportunity as the original 13, the 13 independent states, used to be called the 13 uh, English colonies. So they were trying to practice a way to be fair and promote equality um, in this Northwestern area. So this document is very important because it provides an organized way to add new states into the union. So we have a union of states. Later that name will change to the United States. As of now, it was a union of states. Okay, so I talked about some of the good things about the AOC, but there are also some shortcomings in the AOC. When I say shortcomings, I'm talking about limitations, some weaknesses. See, Congress made the AOC weak on purpose. Congress made this document that was governing the Union of States, they made it weak on purpose because the new American government did not want to create a system that would abuse people. Government abuse, that's called tyranny. See, the Americans, they remember how they were treated under King George III. And they're like, we're not trying to do that again. We're not trying to be the boss of everybody and make all of these kind of rules and abuse people's rights. We don't want that. So they made the document weak on purpose. Under the AOC, the government did not have the power to make people pay taxes. That caused most of the problems in the first place between the colonists and King George III. So no ability to make anybody pay taxes. That's going to become a problem. Because if you don't have people paying taxes, well, how are you going to get money to pay America's bills? How are you going to pay for war? Because they were in the middle of a war, the American Revolutionary War. How are you going to pay for what the soldiers need if you can't make people pay taxes? So later on, that's going to be a big problem. Also, there's no national army. There was no single army for the whole Union of States. Now, each state had their own small militia, but there was not like one large army for America. Later on, that's going to be a problem, too. No national court. OK, that's going to be a problem, because what if I lived in the state of Rhode Island and I was doing business with somebody from New York and now we have a business disagreement? Who is going to hear our court case and solve the problem? No one, because there's no national court. That is going to be a problem. Another problem is no national currency. Currency is money. So if the state of New York, their money doesn't even look the same as the money, say, in Georgia, and we're trying to trade with each other, that could be a very serious problem. Another problem, and this is probably one of the most serious problems, is that Congress couldn't get anything done. You needed nine out of 13 states to agree to pass a law. 
if you can't get nine out of the 13 states to agree, then that bill was not going to become a law. It's hard to get two people to agree with each other. How are you going to get nine out of 13 to agree? So the shortcomings of the AOC started creating a lot of problems for the Americans after the American Revolutionary War was over. And so Congress is now like scratching their head, like what are we going to do? Because we can't get things done. We can't tax people. We don't have an army for America. This is starting to be a problem. Now, things are going to get a little bit worse. Not going to get better. They're going to get a little bit worse. Because after the American Revolutionary War, you're going to have a lot of farmers who were veterans. They fought in the military. But once they got out of the military, they could not repay the loans that they needed to pay back to the government. There's a man, his name is Daniel Shea. Daniel Shea, he was a captain in the army. He was a veteran. He fought in the American Revolutionary War. He is about to go to jail because during this time, if you borrowed money, if you took out a loan and you couldn't pay that money back, you want to jail. You're going to lose your property. They could take your farm and then put you in jail. That's what happened to Daniel Shea. So Daniel Shea, he mad about that. He perturbed. That's my college word that I like. It means you're angry. Daniel Shea, he is upset that the government is taking the farmers' property and putting the farmers in prison, putting them in jail because they couldn't pay back the money that they owe. Daniel Shea, he said, that's not right. That's not right. I was a soldier. I fought for independence. I fought against Great Britain for America to have their freedom. And now you're going to tell me just because I can't pay my bill, you're going to take away my property? You're going to put me in prison? Wait, what? Daniel Shea, he was mad about it. But the government wasn't trying to listen to him. He's from Massachusetts. So Daniel Shea, he hooked up with some of his other friends that he knew from the military, other veterans, other farmers. And they start protesting. They're mad at the government, but they got a little violent. They got a little violent. They start burning down the courthouse. They start burning down government buildings. Now, there's a reason why they burned down the you know, courthouse. That's where all the paperwork was at, to show who owed what amount. And so Daniel Shea, he was causing a lot of problems for the government. And government was getting worried because the state of Massachusetts, they had like a small militia like a group of, of men who had weapons, but there's no army for America. There's not like one large army that could go to Massachusetts and make Daniel Shea stop. So people start getting worried because other farmers was having problems in other states too. And just imagine if the people started protesting and going against Congress and it start to spread out, Congress wouldn't be able to handle this problem. It's too serious. Fortunately, the government in Massachusetts is going to work it out with Daniel Shea and these farmers to make them stop with, the, with all the rioting and burning down buildings. And it was just a bad situation. So Congress, they said, ooh, we can't let this happen again. We got lucky this time, but we can't let this happen again. We're going to need to have a meeting. And we're going to need to talk about the government's power, because right now we don't have enough power. We barely was able to stop Daniel Shea and all these farmers. So we're going to have to have a meeting and figure out what can we do to make the government more powerful. So Daniel Shea, uh, this situation is called Shea's Rebellion. And this is like the straw that broke the camel's back. America realized we have got to have a stronger central government. It's too many weaknesses, too many limitations with the Articles of Confederation. So there is going to be a meeting. The meeting will be held in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The year is 1787. This meeting is called the Constitutional Convention. It's a convention. That word convention is like a meeting. Uh, think of like Comic-Con. I don't know if you're into comic books or not, but Comic-Con, they have a the convention where you dress up like the superheroes and the people that look like uh, different superheroes, they meet and they talk. So kind of think of it like that. 
The Constitutional Convention is going to have delegates from all over America. They're going to meet and they're going to discuss what should we do about the AOC because the AOC has too many shortcomings. Now, at the meeting, things weren't going very well. People arguing. Uh, when I say argue, I'm not talking like fighting and nagging at each other, but they're just showing different points of views. And some people believe that the AOC it wasn't going to be able to be fixed. It has too many weaknesses, too many shortcomings. We're not going to be able to fix it. And some people were suggesting that we just come up with a new document, a document that gives America more power, give the government more power. Some people don't like that because they're concerned about how much power will the government have? And will the government try to abuse people once they get too much power? They don't know. All they know is that the federal government has to get stronger. Okay, so when I talk about the federal government from this point on, um, I'm going to be, I might say federal government, I might say central government, I might say national government, but I'm talking about the same thing. It is the government for America at the highest level. Okay, so if you look at that little uh, graphic at where it has the map, it says USA. Now you see federal, central, national. I'm using these words interchangeable, uh, interchangeably for this unit. So we are now in the critical period. This time, people, what should be done? It seems like the government is falling apart, barely hanging on. Even George Washington, George Washington said under the Article of Confederation, this government is like a rope made out of sand. Now think about that, a rope made out of sand. Things are falling apart. We're together. We're supposed to be helping each other, but we're falling apart. Got to do something about this. Now, at the Constitutional Convention, everybody don't think alike. So we have two groups that are merging. One group will be called the Federalist. Another group will call themselves the Anti-Federalist. Let's focus on the Federalist. Now the Federalist, this group of political leaders, they want a strong central government. Let me say that again. This group, they want a strong central government. And when I say strong central government, I'm talking about the national government, a federal government. They want the government to have more power. They want the government to have the power to make people pay taxes. So to be able to collect taxes. They want one national army for America. They also want protection because it's like a, America is like a little baby. They're newly formed. They're learning how to do things. And they're afraid that another country could come in and attack them, attack them, go back to war. It could be a lot of problems. So they need protection from foreign enemies. So this group that's called the Federalists, they want to ratify a new document called the U.S. Constitution. Ratify, it just means to approve. Now, they're not trying to force people to approve this new document. That would be acting like a king or a tyrant. We don't want any government abuse. So they are allowing the delegates, the, the people who came to the meeting, these representatives from the states, to, they're asking them to ratify this new document, approve this document so that the government can be stronger and have more power. See, during this time, there was only one branch of government. When you were in seventh grade, you learned about the three branches of government. Well, at this time, there was only one branch, the legislative branch. All they could do is make laws. That's about it. But they're saying we need an executive branch. We also need a judicial branch. So now they, they're they saying we need to have one person who's in charge of our nation, an executive leader, like a president. They're saying we need a president. We need a leader. And they also want a judicial branch, a group of judges that could serve as the judges or the justices for America. 
So if there's a problem in between states, they could take that issue all the way up to what they're going to form will be called the Supreme Court. It's at the federal level. So you have men like John Jay, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton. They are considered federalists. They are the one who are pushing for this strong central government. Now, they are going to be writing what they call the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were essays. And just like, you know, you write essays about what you're learning in history. Well, these men, they were writing essays. Um, the person who will do most of the writing is Alexander Hamilton. They're going to write about 85 essays. That's a lot. 85 essays. And Alexander Hamilton, he's going to write like 51 of the 85. He does a lot of writing. And if you didn't see the Disney uh, viewing of Hamilton, you should see it. Excellent. I went, I saw it. I loved it. Great. So watch Hamilton. He is writing most of the Federalist Papers, and he's trying to convince the other delegates to ratify the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution is the document that will make people, um, that will allow the government to have people pay taxes. It will create one national army. It will provide protection from uh, foreign enemies. Um, under the new constitution, you will have an executive branch, you will have a judicial branch. So now you have all three branches of government. Well, the Federalists are saying that the document called the U.S. Constitution, that document is an A+. Plus. We should go with it. We should ratify it. It'll be good for America. It will make America strong. So they are trying to convince the other delegates at the meeting because they're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, trying to convince them to vote yes and ratify this new document, a stronger document called the U.S. Constitution. Well, there's another group. This group is called the Anti-Federalists. Now, anti, whenever you see that in front of a word, you know that anti, that prefix means against. So this group is against the Federalists. They said, no. We're not going to ratify that document. That document is an F minus. If you ratify that document, if you approve that document, you're going to get yourself abused. We can't give the government too much power. All they're going to do is abuse people. See, the anti-federalists, they like kind of stuck in the past. They remember all the problems that they had with King George III. And so they're thinking if we get a president, if we get an executive leader, he's going to start acting like he's a king. And he's going to abuse people right. And they probably get in control of the military and then force people to pay taxes that they don't want to pay. They said, don't do this. This is bad. By the way, all that really is going to happen. But during this time, they didn't know it was going to happen. Well, the anti-federalists, they're thinking we got to be protected. One of the anti-federalists, his name is George Mason. He's going to come up with a really good idea. George Mason, he says, we need a bill of rights. We need to have our rights protected because, you know, you can't do too much of anything without paperwork. So George Mason, he wants to, the, the government to make a list of the rights that people have. Well, people like Alexander Hamilton are like, that is just, that's doing the most. That's too much. You can't list everybody's right, what they have. So the federal is like, you don't even need a bill of rights. You should be able to trust the government. Nobody's going to get abused. Just cooperate and let's ratify this new document. But the anti federal is like, no, nah, we're not doing that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It is, we should not be giving the federal government too much power. We need to be powerful, but we need to be powerful at the state level. So the anti-federalists, they want the states to have the power, keep the power. They understand that the federal government got to be stronger, but they don't want it too strong where people start to get their rights taken away or people start getting abused or the government just, just taking people money with all kinds of different taxes. So now we have disagreements between the federalists and the anti-federalists. The Federalists want a strong central government. The Anti-Federalists say, we don't trust you. We don't want to get abused by the government.
So they're arguing back and forth. Now, there are going to be some more problems at this constitutional convention. Another problem is going to emerge and it's going to be between the large states and the smaller states. Okay. Now, the issue is about taxation and representation. Now, remember under King George III, you had taxation with no representation. The, the colonists were not allowed to be a part of the British Parliament that was all the way in Great Britain. But now, since the Americans have their independence and they're putting their government together, they say we will have taxation and we will have representation, but how do we do it? How do we be fair about taxation and representation? Well, the larger states start saying, well, we need to have more representation because we got more people. We got more responsibilities. Well, the smaller states, they don't like that. They said, that's not fair. We want equal representation. We should all be treated the same, just like we were under the AOC. Everybody was equal under the, the AOC. Well, now we got arguments going back and forth about how much representation do you have in the legislative branch. The legislative branch is the group that's going to be making the laws. Well, they write bills, you write the bill, and then the bill can be become a law, but it's a whole process that we're going to learn about in the next unit about how a bill becomes a law. The legislative branch, they control the money, they make the laws. The larger states want more representation. The smaller states says, no, that's not fair. We want equal representation. So they're trying to figure out what to do because the smaller states are saying, if you're not going to be fair and you're not going to treat us right, then we don't need to be a part of this union of states. We'll just start our own country. Well, the Congress is like, wait, hold up. We, we're going to figure this out. Give us a moment. We got to think about this. H how do we do it? How do we make this fair? And they are going to come up with a plan. The solution to solve the problem between the larger states and the smaller states will be called the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise was part of two plans that were put together, the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. So when we look at the Great Compromise, what it does is divide the legislative branch into two parts. The two parts, we call that a bicameral Congress. Bi meaning two, cameral think of two houses or two parts, okay? So the legislative branch is divided into two parts. On the left side, we have the House of Representatives, and on the right side, we have the Senate. These two parts make up Congress, the lawmakers, the representation for each of the states. Now, if you look at the pictures, you'll see what Congress looks like today. Um, Congress together is the House of Representatives plus the Senate combined. That is what we call Congress. Now, let's take a look at the two parts of the Great Compromise. That's the name of the actual agreement. It's called the Great Compromise. It wasn't just great. It was great, but it's also the name of the, of the agreement, the Great Compromise. So part one of the Great Compromise says, we want to make sure everybody is okay, everybody is happy, everybody don't feel like they're being abused, we don't want anybody to feel abused. So on the Senate side of Congress, we are going to allow two senators for every state. It doesn't matter if you're a large state or a small state, we're gonna treat everybody equally, so everybody gets two senators to serve in the Senate part of Congress. So the smaller state is like, that's nice. We, we being treated fairly. Every state gets two. Well, the larger state is like, well, what about us? What are we going to get? See, chill. Relax. I got you. Congress is like, we got a plan. So first, we got to let everybody know that each state gets two senators. Then we move to part two. 
part two of the great compromise is now we're going to deal with the House of Representatives. Now, the agreement for the great compromise says the total number of lawmaking representatives that each state has must be based on the population. So Congress said each state, you're going to have to count your citizens. You got to count your people. And then we're going to tell you how many representatives you get in the House of Representatives. So the number is unknown. You see in the box, in the red box, it shows that it's a question mark because it's like a missing variable. You remember in your math class when you're solving for X? Well, think of Congress like that. You're solving for X. It's a missing variable. Based on how many people you have, that determines how many representatives you get. If you have a lot of people in your state, then you want to get a lot of representatives. If you have a small amount of people in your state, then you're going to get a small amount of representative. It just depends, but you have to count your people first. The larger states, they were fine with this. They said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. And so we agree to settle the problem by using the Great Compromise. So the Great Compromise was a success. It solved the problem between the large states and the smaller states. Now, we, we see the Great Compromise in our society today. If you look at this current map of the United States, you'll see that the states have a number and the numbers are different. That's because the population of the state. If you have a large state, say like Texas, look at Texas, Texas gets 38 representatives for the House of Representatives. Look at the large state of California. California gets 55 representatives in the House of Representatives because California has a very large population. So the larger your state, the more people you have, then the more representatives you get. But if you are from a smaller state that has smaller population, you don't get as many people. Look at Louisiana, that's right next to Texas, to the east of Texas. Louisiana only gets eight, only eight representatives. Look at Montana, all the way at the top in the northwest. Montana only gets three representatives because in Montana, there's not a lot of people in that state. So the Great Compromise, it solves a problem between the large states and the small states, two senators for each state, and then for the House of Representatives, it just depends on your population. The more people you have in your state, the more lawmaking representatives you get in Congress. Now, this is going to become another problem because the more people you have, when you start counting your people, if you got a lot of people, you're going to get a lot of more representatives. Now, let me show you why this becomes a problem. It becomes a problem because the North and the South are going to have a disagreement. The Southern states, they, they decided, well, we're going to count all our enslaved Africans. Because if we, we count all our enslaved Africans, we can bump up our numbers for the population and now we can get more representatives. They said, we're being taxed. We're being taxed on the number of enslaved Africans we have because they're our property. So why not get a fair deal, get a better deal with having more representatives in the House of Representatives by counting the black people as part of the population? Well, that's what the South wanted to do, the Southern states. But the Northern states said, no, we don't like that. We don't even have a lot of slaves in our area. In the, North, the Northern part of America, the Northeast part, the slavery would, had been pretty much faded away, especially since you had the Northwest ordinance. So you had black people who worked in the North and they were free. And they had jobs and you had to pay them for the work that they did. Now, they weren't citizens, but they were not slaves as well. They had paperwork saying that they, they were free. Well, the North and the South, now they're arguing. They're going back and forth about 
representation about taxation. The South want to count all the enslaved Africans. The North says, no, you're not going to do that. And the North said, in fact, maybe we should just abolish slavery altogether because the, the South is having a, an unfair economic advantage. You got black people working for you, but you're not paying them. If a black person worked for me in the North, I got to pay them. That's not right. So they're arguing back and forth. And the North is saying that the government need to regulate slavery and, and the slave trade and maybe even in slavery in America. So now you got different points of views, different opinions about how to count the black people. What do we do about counting slaves? What do we do about counting black people? They're arguing back and forth between the North and the South. So the government says, okay, fine. We're gonna solve the problem. There's a way to do this. We just gotta think and come up with a solution. Okay, so the solution will be made. And I believe it's James Madison. He will come up with this way to count black people. It is called the three-fifth compromise. Three-fifth. Now, the government saying, okay, we're going to count the black people, but we're not going to give you like full credit. Think of it like that. We're not going to give you full credit. They said for every five black people, they are equal to three white people in the population. Wait, what? Yeah. See, during this time in history, Black people were considered to be property. Black people were not considered citizens. And so the government said, I cannot count a Black person equal to a white person. So we're going to do the math a little bit different. Black people were considered three-fifths of a human being. Three-fifths, a fraction of a person. And so the government said, we are only going to count three-fifths of the population of, of Black people. Now, the North, they didn't quite get everything they wanted. So they had to compromise. They got some of what they wanted because at least you're not counting all the Black people. And then the South, they didn't quite get everything that they wanted. but at least the government is going to count some of their other Black people. So this three-fifth compromise seemed to work for America. It created a way to have representation in Congress based on population, and that was for the, the House of Representatives, and it allowed the government to count Black people. It was a formula. It was a way to count Black people, but Unfortunately, Black people did not receive any rights from the Three-Fifth Compromise. They do not receive any freedom. They remained slaves. For those uh, Black people that were in the South were still enslaved. And it was just a way to make sure that the owners or that, the, uh, the, that Black people would be counted only for um, taxation and representation purposes, but not about freedom, not about uh, having rights in this country at all. So that's the three-fifth compromise. Think of the three-fifth compromise. Think of North versus South counting slaves. And that's different from the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise is when the legislative branch is divided into two parts. And that's how we got the House of Representatives and the Senate. Okay. So uh, many historians will say that the Constitutional Convention of 1787 was a success. It was a success because compromise uh, was made between the northern state and the southern states, as well as the larger states and the smaller states. Compromise were made between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And in the end, um, an agreement was made to go ahead and provide a bill of rights for um, the Americans, because this is something that the anti-federalists, they really wanted, and they did not want to ratify the Constitution unless they got a bill of rights that, that said what uh, rights Americans have. Now, the bill of rights will not be written at the Constitution. That's going to come a few years later. 
like 1791. But during the Constitutional Convention of 1787, the two groups agree to ratify the U.S. Constitution. This is the stronger document that will give the government the power to tax. It will give America one large uh, military for uh, the United States. It will give us the three branches of government. And this document makes America stronger and has more power. And the new document is called the, the U.S. Constitution. It's strong, but it's very flexible. Now, Unit 5 is when I will talk about um, more of the document called the U.S. Constitution. So wrapping up with today, um, this lesson that I taught was about the challenges, the achievements, and the compromises that were made at the Constitutional Convention at that meeting in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1787. Our next stop will be Unit 5. I will be talking about the U.S. Constitution, also the principles of government. These are ways that the um, delegates came up with so that the government could be flexible and not abuse people. And also I'll be talking about the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are the first 10 changes or the amendments to the U.S. Constitution. And the government today is uh, operates under the U.S. Constitution. And now the Bill of Rights is given and applied to everyone that lives in our country. Okay, so we'll get into that more when we get to Unit 5. I want to thank you for joining me today in the urban classroom. It has been my privilege and my joy to continue to teach and tell you about U.S. history. We're learning um, information from the 13 original English colonies all the way up to settling the Western frontier after the Civil War and Reconstruction. So be sure to watch my next video when I teach Unit 5, the U.S. Constitution. I want to thank you for joining me today. I want you to have a great day. And why don't you just make it a great day? Bye.